you know, most of the time you meet these people that, you know, they're trying to get away. They got things to do. He said, after a while, I started talking to him. And after I realized I got things to do. Jim would always take a time with you like he had forever for you. I mean, you'd call him up just to say, what time are we leaving? Well, you're on the phone for 45 minutes. Greetings, everybody. Keith Billick here. The weather is nice up here in Michigan, and so I, I like to take advantage of those beautiful evenings and get out here and record these intros in the natural, friendly confines of my suburban Detroit backyard studio. And I, I know I said it's a friendly confine, and, and it really, really is, with one major exception. I'm recording underneath one of these pop-up tents and there's a gigantic spider just a few feet over my head right now. So I'm a bit paranoid about that. I'm basically staring upwards at a spider, keeping my eye on its every move, making sure it's not going to come attack me. But if in the middle of this intro I start shrieking like a, uh, a 12-year-old girl, you'll know what happened. And that's no offense to 12-year-old girls intended there, but it, it's just not how I usually sound. So you know that something has gone very wrong if that happens. Anyway, this is the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast. Thanks, everyone, for listening. However, an extra special thanks for listening and for supporting the show goes out to Renee Redman. I don't have a whole lot of information about Renee, but she clearly has impeccable tastes in both instrument selection, podcast choices, and she obviously has a sparkling personality and wonderful sense of humor to boot. Renee, thank you so much for supporting the show. Couldn't do it without people like you. If you'd like to become a supporter of the show, do what Renee did and go to patreon.com slash banjo podcast. That's the way you can figure out how to get cool prizes and support the show in the process. One of the cool prizes that I offer is a monthly video meetup with me and also your fellow VIP listeners. Like I said, that's a monthly meetup. We've done a handful of them now. They're always a great time. We, we usually get on to at least one or two really cool topics. And I have just scheduled the August VIP lounge meetup. That is going to be happening 5 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesday, August 25th. I try to adjust those dates. I know we have listeners in a whole bunch of different time zones. And so I just kind of pick a different one every time, and I hope that works for a lot of you. If not, I record them and post them later. So either way, if you sign up on Patreon, you will have access to those meetups, whether you can join us live or not. Other ways to support the show, head over to banjopodcast.com and consider picking up one of my super cool logo t-shirts. They are very comfortable and will make you the envy of your whole neighborhood. And other than that, feel free to give me some feedback and let me know what you think, either by reviewing the show or by getting in touch with me directly. You can get a hold of me at pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com, or I'm also on the social medias. You can look for me by name on Facebook. I am picky underscore fingers on Instagram. Or if you are on Twitter, go follow at Banjo Podcast. Those are all me. So anything you do on there, I will, uh, I'll see it and I love hearing from you. Today's special guest is Lloyd Douglas, the banjo player for Michigan-based bluegrass band Full Chord Bluegrass. And I love spreading the word about those guys. They are close friends of mine, and I always love hearing them play, and especially Lloyd's playing. He's one of my favorites. He's a very underrated player overall, but when you're the guy that Michael Cleveland calls for gigs and recordings, you know, uh, you know there must be something to it. In fact, I love telling a story about uh, one of my bass playing friends, Jeremy Darrow, he's actually the one who plays on my theme music. But he used to play with Lloyd in a different Michigan band called Detour. And Jeremy told me that 
whenever they would play festivals and, and Detour would take the stage, Jeremy would see all the banjo players come from the, from the campgrounds and the parking lots. They would stop their picking just to come gather around and, and watch what Lloyd was doing on stage. So even though he's underrated, the word has gotten out because all those banjo players knew what was about to happen and they want, didn't want to miss it. And I totally get that. I go see Lloyd play whenever I can. Also, a very important shout out goes to one of my favorite venues in my area. That is the Parliament Room at Otis Supply. And they have some of the best live music around my area. And I have been very fortunate enough that Tom and Scott, the owners there, are, are generous with their space and allow me to come set up and do interviews. And I've done that on multiple occasions. So this time is no different. Uh, this interview took place at Otis Supply. So that actually also explains if you, if you hear some background restaurant-ish sounding noise during this interview, that's what that is. But here it is, my conversation with Lloyd Douglas of Full Chord Bluegrass. My name is Lloyd Douglas. I'm from Alpena, Michigan. Uh, started playing banjo probably when I was uh, probably nine years old, I believe. Um, my family plays. I mean, my dad, he played guitar. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I was growing up, uh, he would play with some friends that played bluegrass. And somehow along the way, I wanted a, a banjo. And uh, that's kind of how it started, I guess. So you chose the banjo as opposed to, I don't know, your parents pushing it on you somehow. Yep. My... My parents would say if I was in the other room playing and the banjo come on TV, I'd run out, <laughs> listen to the banjo. When it was done, I'd go back to whatever I was doing. And that's and I wanted the banjo. So that's, yeah, they didn't push it. You probably can't remember being so young, but do you have any idea what it was about the banjo that made you choose that one as opposed to any of the other instruments that you might have been hearing? No, I, I don't really remember now. Just tends to be a, an attention-grabbing type of sound, I think. Yep, yep. Cool. So then your your folks got you a banjo, you said? Yep. How did you start learning? Did you dive right in trying to jam with dad and, and the friends or what? Well, um, first there was a, a lady in uh, Alpena, Michigan, where I'm from, that uh, taught. She wasn't really a banjo player per se, but she was a music instructor and she'd had a banjo. And so we started in on the Earl Scruggs book. I did that for maybe a year and she showed me some of the roles and I learned that. And then after that, it was just kind of just getting records and well, I'll uh, probably date myself cassettes and just, you know, going back and just listening and trying to pick it apart. Right. Did you find that, I don't know, how difficult did you find that for a little kid to be trying to listen to that stuff by ear and, and pick it out? I didn't, uh, I don't really remember now. Um, it's probably more painful for my parents to listen to than it was <laughs> for me. But uh, yeah, I don't, you know, you just listen to it over and over and over and, you know, pick up the needle, put it back and just... And just try to figure it out. I wasn't smart enough to realize that there was a 16 speed. Right. I could have slowed it down. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you just, you know, I just worked it. I don't remember really. I and mean, it's like I said, it's been a while ago, but yeah, that's how I just kind of figured stuff out. Uh huh. And how far was your teacher able to get you? She was able to help you work through that book, it sounds like. And... Uh, just basically the roles. I mean, basically, we started on Foggy Mountain Breakdown. And I think when I left, I was still working on Foggy Mountain Breakdown. But yeah, okay. I mean, it was just, she just took me basically to, to get the roles and maybe learn a few chords, you know, but for the most part, um, I, I picked most of it up by myself. Well, if she was a general music teacher, the funny thing about that Scruggs book is it actually had the staff notation too. Was she trying to like play any on the piano or to check your no. notes to see if they were correct? No, she just, she had another banjo there and she, it was almost like she was learning as she went along too. Okay. I mean, it, she uh, was basically, I think a violin teacher. All right. So. Got it. And so it seems like you must have been hearing at least a bit of Scruggs if you were working out of that book. Do you oh, remember yeah. any other players or bands that really caught your ear that you loved listening to? Uh, back then, uh, well, Flat and Scruggs was huge. And right then in the beginning, I guess, you know, Reno and Smiley, I liked them a lot. Mm-hmm. Jim and Jesse, you know, Alan Shelton playing. Um, that was right away. That's what I, you know, but later I got in other bands too. Right. I mean, I, I was a huge Monroe freak when I was young. I mean, that's what I wanted to, to do. So I listened to a lot mm-hmm. of Blake Williams and what he was doing because that's who he had playing banjo when I was growing up. And the Johnson Mountain Boys loved them. 
Richard Underwood's playing and right. Tom Adams both. I mean, yeah. them were the ones that I kind of followed growing up mostly. Got it. And so when did you actually get to start jamming with people? Did you have people your own age to to play with? I mean, it sounds like your brother is, is a musician too. I don't know if he was older or younger or what. But. Uh, he's uh, younger than me by a couple of years. He didn't start playing till a few years after I did maybe. And okay. he's a bass player. He plays bass with Michael Cleveland right now. But yeah, we we didn't start playing together for a few years, but I'd play with dad, you know. Dad would dad could pick out tunes on the banjo too, but with a flat pick. Okay. Because he didn't know the role, so he'd uh-huh. like show me the melody, and then I'd sometimes, you know, I'd pick it off from there. Okay. When do you think you noticed something that you would identify as like your personal style emerging? Do you remember uh, how that came about? I guess I just tried to take something from all the people that I liked and just try to form it into my own. And I don't really know when that morphed into being, I guess. Right. Yeah, it's probably kind of a a broader transition than just a one day you wake up and, (laughs) and have something that you didn't have before. Yeah. What are some elements of what you were learning that you view as being important parts of your style today, I guess, might be a different way of looking at it? Can you rephrase the question again? <laughs> uh, I mean, are, are there any skills or things that you stumbled upon that, that you thought let you improve um, a lot as a player? Maybe things that you still learn today that, that you view as a main part of your style or like techniques that you rely on a lot or yeah, just anything like that. I'm not like really that. sure when I stumbled on them. Uh, but I know, I, you know with Don Reno, I mean, I use a lot of single string at times. Let's just take that, I guess. Uh, So for for Don Reno, what were some of the things that you heard him do that you set out to learn and and maybe even incorporate into your own uh, playing? I I guess with the single string stuff, I mean, it just helped me to pick out the melody of songs a little easier than having to roll through them just to get out of situations, especially fiddle tunes, if you want to play the melody. I mean, for me, it was hard to just pick it straight scrugs and try to get the melody on some of them. So, I mean, something something that I, I mean, I hear a lot of things in your playing that are really, really cool. And we'll talk about a bunch of them, but it might be tough for me to, to describe, but I hear you doing a lot of like inside roles. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yep. So what would be an example of just a cool thing that maybe even listeners could work on to, I don't know, to, to include that in their playing or give an example of like a cool lick or approach or how you work on that? Uh, like if you're talking, I, I consider an inside role that is uh, like where you move your middle finger into the the second string is that what That's you're talking about? That's what I mean. Yeah. Okay, so something like a. Something like that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know when I started doing those, but uh, every now and then I'll just do them, usually without even thinking about it. <laughs> right. But. Or or also using those in conjunction with maybe like a chromatic open string to kind of get a a gnarly alternating bluesy i don't know it's it's so hard to describe these techniques without uh, yeah, I'm not sure really getting into it a lot of times i don't remember what i played when i played it <laughs> okay. unless i hear it back and then i'd remember but yeah i'm not sure what you're talking about right there but another probably my favorite aspect of your playing is the note separation you get This is something that uh, 
I guess I'll take a minute and demonstrate something that my we do like a video meetup with my listeners and I, and we were talking about note separation recently. Mm -hmm. And that's something I've been thinking more about lately. And, and you seem to be able to do that really well, <clears throat> get that nice, sharp, clear attack. So talk about that. It seems like that must be something you, you've worked on or are at least aware of. Yeah. Um, well, I, I practice a lot uh, when I was growing up to the Foggy Mountain Banjo album, and I just play that over and over. And also, like, uh, all the roles that were in the Scruggs book, I'd just sit down and just play them. I mean, even without uh, playing a song, I just... Well, hopefully a little better than that, but... <laughs> there you go. And just try to get the notes separate from the other one, just take my time. I mean, I don't know if I was ever really conscious of it, per se, but I just work on the roles and just try to get them kind of like Earl did with, you know... Oh. So, so you never, I mean, someone like me, that's something that actually bothers me about my playing. I, I, I could use a bit more of that note separation. So I start thinking about very small finger motions. You never had to go through anything like that of trying to, I don't know, strike the string quicker or. No, um, I never really thought about it, I guess. Uh, just came natural. <laughs> I guess it did. <laughs> I mean, I would practice rolls, I mean, all the time. Even when I was at school, I'd just sit there with my hand and just, you know, think of the rolls. And But I don't remember ever thinking thinking too much about note separation, except later, you know, if, like there's certain players, like you listen to Crow, I can't get the note separation like he does. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just something I can't do. But like Earl, I'd listen to him and I'd just practice with him. And I think it's just something that just come in naturally because... So much I was playing with those records back then, it just it just came that way. Yeah, yeah, could be. I've heard you're an avid, are you an avid Telecaster player or electric guitar in general? I like your guitar in general. I played with some country bands back home and some blues bands. And uh, it's kind of a, a thing I did back up there because there wasn't a lot of call for banjo players. Yeah. So uh, in order to make money, I'd play guitar. And sometimes I'd play some fiddle in these bands too to make money and it'd help out. Okay. And uh, yeah, I did a lot of that. Do you play bluegrass fiddle? Not very well. Okay. Not that anybody really wants to hear. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I can play some country fiddle, but... Well, I guess what I'm getting at with the guitar is that I'm wondering if, if any of that has transferred over and influenced your banjo playing. And if so, what are, what are some guitar things that you use on your banjo? Yeah, I guess some of those licks have come over, um, specific licks. Um, you know, like maybe something like a... Something like that, maybe I might throw in there. Or Is that kind of a Danny Gatton sort of? Yeah, it might thing. be a Danny Ganny kind of thing, or yeah, or uh, yeah. Let's see, or something like that, or. You and know, what, what are you doing there? Was that a bit of a palm muty? Uh, see, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Uh, maybe a palm with a little bit. I okay. like with full chord if we're doing something like Jerry Reed stuff, I might do some of those licks mm -hmm. in there to bake my way through it. <laughs> but yeah, well, I get some licks in there, like, you know, I'm like, or... You know, something like that from the guitar, yeah. but... But usually, I mean, I didn't have a specific guy I listened to. I mean, I just, you know, whatever songs we were playing in the band, I'd learn them and then just, mm -hmm. tr you know, try to get them as close as the record as I could. I See mean, what you could do. And sometimes that transfers over to the banjo, and sometimes it don't. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess that sort of brings me to another thing that sometimes I get frustrated by is, is sometimes I find it difficult to play the more swingy, boogie-woogie style of playing as opposed to the rolling straight through bluegrassy stuff. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be something you're pretty adept at. Oh, and I'm thanks. wondering if there's a different mindset or approach that you take to those songs. I guess what you were just demonstrating on the, the like your guitar licks, that sort of reminded me of some of the things that I've heard you do on the swing stuff. 
Yeah, I don't even know what I'm thinking when I'm doing it. I mean, I just try to <laughs> try to get through, usually trying to play some sort of kind of melody and something that just fits. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah, I'm, and I don't know. Do you feel like you're playing more guitaristically uh, on that stuff? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, okay. especially a lot of the stuff with full chord. Um, yeah, Brian really gravitates to, like you were saying, the, um, um, I'm blanking on it now. but Swing the, stuff, maybe, or... Uh, the Jerry, Jerry Reed, Reed stuff, stuff. Yeah. 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 Yeah, stuff like that. I mean, mm -hmm. we'll do a lot of stuff like that. And sometimes, you know, I mean, it's it's just all improv. You know, usually you're just mm -hmm. kind of messing off at the top of your head. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not so good. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to maximize the good stuff and, yep. and minimize the bad yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I guess that leads into, so it sounds like you improvise quite a bit. Yeah, with these guys a lot. I mean, okay. especially playing with Grant uh, Flick on fiddle and Brian Overland on mandolin there. They're always coming up with new, every time they play a break, it's different. Uh huh. So, I mean, and I'm not one of those guys that can play something 10 different ways, but th they'll push you. I mean, they'll make you have to play something different. Hmm. Just to match their level of yeah. keeping things interesting? Yep, exactly. Do you have a way that you practice improvising or how did you, how did you get fluent with that? Well, I, I don't know if I practice uh, so much, but I mean, when I was younger, I played played some jazz, and you know, you just have to improv in that a lot. But jazz on banjo? No. Okay. I, I, I was not even very good on it on guitar, to be honest. Okay. But I played in some jazz bands in high school and college, and uh, but yeah, you know, I think that kind of prepared me for doing a little bit more of it out like this. Yeah, with these guys, I mean, you just, I mean, it's just kind of off the top of my head. I don't really <laughs> like the more I'm playing, the better it is. I mean, if, sure. if my mind's been, if I've been playing three or four days and I, I'm better at it, if I haven't been playing for a while, sometimes it's, I can't, I can't force it. Yeah, if I force it, then mm -hmm. it's just, it's kind of rough. Hey everyone, Keith here. I was just chilling in my backyard studio again and thought I need to tell everyone about our great, great sponsors. The first is Peghead Nation. Peghead Nation is a streaming site to take courses in banjo, guitar, mandolin, fiddle, dobro, upright bass, uke, and through those courses you can learn bluegrass, old time, and plenty of other styles from some of the best instructors in all of Roots music. PegheadNation.com features a great lineup of banjo instruction. Here are some of the courses. Beginning bluegrass banjo with Bill Evans, you know him. He also teaches bluegrass banjo, you can learn Clawhammer Banjo with Evie Layden, Wade Ward style banjo with Bruce Molsky, the banjo according to Danny Barnes, or contemporary bluegrass banjo with Wes Corbett. Now each of these courses include high quality multi-angle video lessons, downloadable notation and tab, play along tracks, and plenty of tunes and songs to play. And the bonus feature of these is that just by being a listener of Picky Fingers, you can get your first month free. Just go to pegheadnation.com, use the promo code PICKYFINGERS at checkout, and you'll get to sample any of these for absolutely free. Picky Fingers is also brought to you in part by Elderly Instruments up in Lansing, Michigan. We all know that it's so much cooler to support small independent businesses, and it really helps out when that independent business also happens to be the most knowledgeable and trusted source around for new used and vintage stringed instruments. And I'm talking, of course, about elderly instruments. They've been family owned and operated since 1972. And you can go to elderly.com to check out their wide selection of all stringed instruments. We're talking all the banjos and banjo accessories and learning products that you could ever want. But if you happen to have a hankering for Let's say electric guitar, acoustic guitar, fiddles, ukes, mandolins, they have all that too. So once again, just go to elderly.com or give them a call at 517-372-7880 to talk to one of their knowledgeable sales representatives. You know, I keep bragging about Michigan, but it's hard not to. If you drive from where a lot of the Motown records were recorded and you drive toward Kalamazoo, which is where all those pre-war Gibson banjos were made, Along the way, you get to Battle Creek, which is the home of GHS Strings, another sponsor of the show. You know, even those pre-war Gibson banjos don't sound like much without a good set of strings on them. And GHS are some of the best, and you know that they're some of the best because they're the ones chosen by players such as Bela Fleck, J.D. Crow, Sonny Osborne, 
and me. I've been a user of their PF145 banjo set for quite a few years. And if you need strings for your guitar, mandolin, or any of those other instruments, they're going to have that too. So check out ghsstrings.com for their full selection. Maybe this is a weird question. Do you, do you find yourself playing more with your left hand, trying to find melodies, or versus maybe a right hand technique, stick to a roll? Yeah, it's more single stringy, okay. left hand stuff, usually on that kind of stuff for me. It's, more, it's not so much roll stuff. It was really, I interviewed um, Allison Brown recently, and she, she said when she was improvising, it was interesting to hear, because I don't think I think this way, but she thinks very vertically, like chord shapes, even as she's playing single note lines. Do you have anything like that, or maybe you use more scale-based um, It could be working out of chord shapes. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can see where she's saying that. Um, mm. But I do some scale stuff, too, I guess. So it could be a combination of mine. I never really thought about it too much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just kind of play what I hear in my head when I can play. We, we kind of got derailed with your your learning and your career and started talking about some other stuff but so after all those points of when you were learning out of the Scruggs book and everything when did you first have a chance to sign on with kind of a a bigger maybe more touring type of type of gig what was what was that opportunity for you like in a professional band yeah um that would have been i was i think i was 25 and i Went with David Davis and the Warrior of Boys. Mm -hmm. Met him at Charlotte. They were kind of looking for somebody. Right. And, you know, that's how that happened. And Did they used to wear the outfits? The, oh, yeah. We had the hats. Was that, you had to do that, too? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I love that. You know, I mean, <laughs> uh, I thought that was cool. You know, like I said, I, I wanted to play with Monroe, and I thought that was cool. And the Johnson Mountain Boys and wearing the hats. I thought them guys looked okay. great. Yeah. So for me, wearing a hat was good. Plus, I'm bald. So, you know, I <laughs> protected my head during the, you know, the sun. Right. But yeah, I love that. Uh, oh, that's cool. Yeah, and I played with them guys for I know, a couple of years, two and a half years. And then where did did you end up with Jim and Jesse, or just was it just Jesse? I know you toured with Jesse. It was Jim and Jesse. You and did I, both. Yeah, okay. I, I joined them in uh, January of two thousand, and I left right before Jim died. Uh, Jim died mm -hmm. in like, well, I think it was December thirty first of two thousand two. So I left in November two thousand two. Oh, and then I just, just subbed before. some dates. I subbed some dates oh. with Jesse to help him out at times. Okay. But I, I never regularly it. played with Jesse after Jim had died. Okay. Got it. So to talk a bit about what that, what that means for a player from Alpena, Michigan to finally get to go to more big shows and, and have maybe a little more pressure on you. Uh, it, well, it was pretty cool actually. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, uh, it was like a, you know, a lifelong dream. I mean, there was a few times you'd be standing up there and, uh, you know, if you're doing like Paradise or uh, Sweet Little Miss Blue Eyes or, you know, Hard Hearted, that you just look over and be like, I can't believe that I'm standing here. <laughs> you know, I was, right. and, and those guys were so great to work with too. I mean, some of the two of the nicest fellows I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're both a little different, you know, Jim was pretty outspoken. I mean, he, I mean, I wouldn't say outspoken. He was very talkative, very communicative. Just outgoing. Was, yeah, outgoing, yeah. Okay. And uh, I remember my uncle met him one time. He's like, yeah, most of the time you meet these people, you know, they're trying to get away. They got things to do. He said, right. after a while, I started talking to him. And after I realized I got things to do. <laughs> you know, he said, Jim would always take a time with you like he had forever for you. Yeah. I mean, you'd call him up just to say, what time are we leaving? Well, you're on the phone for 45 minutes. <laughs> and, and Jesse was more reserved, quiet, but he was very deep musically. I mean, there would be times we'd be riding the bus and, like you bring your guitar i'm like yep mm -hmm. so come to the back of the bus we'll play something and it was never what we played on stage it was stuff so different that every time i go back there i'm like i don't even know if i can handle what he's playing huh i mean it, he was very deep he had so much music inside him that like i said we never played stuff that we played on stage that's interesting you say that because when i was doing a little prep work for this interview i, I came across an album that i hadn't heard before it was jesse's um is it called Breaking the Rules or something like that? Oh, the Bending the Rules Bending, album. Bending yes. the Rules. Yes. And I was astonished. I was expecting a relatively traditional kind of thing, and that sounds like Bill Monroe meets dog music or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's, like it's way out It's there. kind of out there. Yeah, that yeah. Was, that's a really good album, yeah.
especially that fiddle player on there. Yeah, who is that? He's, uh, I think he was from Pennsylvania, and he, I don't know how he and, him and Jesse got together, but uh, Jesse said that he had this guy coming down to huh. help us do some dates because we needed the fiddle player, and he played the Opry with us a time or two, and then we started to do this album, and we just got together at Jesse's, I think, like the night before, and uh, started working on some stuff. I didn't do the whole You didn't album. hear those tunes until the night before the, the night recording? Before. Yeah, the night oh, before. Oh, those, are, those aren't easy. <laughs> no, there's some of them there that aren't easy. Uh, but yeah, we just worked some of them out the night before. And then uh, we went in the studio and did one day. And I couldn't do a whole session. I had to be back for something. And then I think another guy played banjo on a couple songs. And Jesse recorded some stuff without banjo. There's two songs. And without, without disparaging anybody, that was actually noticeable when talking about the note separation thing. The... the difference in, in the tracks that you played oh, on thanks. and and didn't i heard it right away for sure <laughs> then how did you how did you end up hooking with hooking up with uh michael cleveland because that's been some of like your most noteworthy gig work in the last few years too right right um well my brother had played with ronda vincent in the rage when mike was in the band oh and that's how i met mike okay and then uh i'm not sure mike was playing somewhere up near i think in tawas michigan and I don't know how I heard that he was looking for a banjo player at the time. So I, and I jammed with him at Spigma and met him around a few times. Okay. And uh, I called him and said, you know, do you need somebody? He said, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I come down there and I filled that weekend with him. And then ever since then, I mean, I just kind of, when he needs somebody, he, he calls me to go out and play That's with so him. That's so cool. Yeah, it's been very cool. I mean, he's an incredible player. Sometimes it's a little intimidating standing next to him. Oh, I bet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's just a ball of fire. He is, at, yep. at all times. Yep. So knowing that, is is there something that that happens with you when you get a, a call to do a recording session with him or, or a string of gigs with him to in order to get yourself in shape and be ready to handle this intimidating situation? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have to practice a lot. I mean, you know, I just work on his material. And the main thing with Mike is that he plays so fast. Mm-hmm. I mean, you... You just have to work on getting your right hand in shape. I mean, you just, you just play with the fastest stuff you can find. You know, a lot of times, like, I'll go on YouTube and find li- live versions of stuff that they've done to see how they're playing it now, if it's changed. Then they'll go to the albums and just practice that. And just yeah. sometimes he'll send me a set list or what they're kind of doing. So I'm kind of, you know, got a heads up on that. Right. And, uh, and like, when we did that one recording session with him, he, he sent most of the songs where I knew before. Okay. There, there was a couple I didn't. There was mo- it was a lot of traditional stuff yeah. or, or traditional. classic stuff. Yeah, yeah there's some classic stuff on it and a couple things he wrote, I think, okay. on that, that album. Yeah. Nice. So when you're working on making sure you can play up to speed, like you were saying, it sounds like you listen to recordings to play along. Is that is that basically what you do or do you have like a metronome routine, routine or anything like that? Or you just try to try to floor it? I just try to floor it. <laughs> yeah, I'm one guy that played with Mike. He said, uh, do you ever, when you play with Mike, does it ever feel like you're just redlining it all the time? I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> good. good. The, guy, the guy's like, man, I feel like there's like, I'd like to put some more in. I just can't. It's like, and sometimes you just can't because it's so fast that. Oh my God. You just kind of got to stick to playing it pretty basic and just get through it. And it's not just playing that fast. It's playing that fast for two hours or, what, or sometimes, whatever yeah. it is. For a f- yeah. <laughs> That's insane. Going back to like your personal style licks and all that stuff. Sometimes I like to phrase it as if, uh, if like a student comes to you and says, you're my banjo hero. I want to play just like you. What, say you're what, listening to the wrong people. <laughs> <laughs> well, what type of things, uh, they're paying you really good for this, by oh, the okay. way. All right. They're all right. In advance. Okay. <laughs> Are, are, is there anything that comes to mind as far as what you would show that person to capture the the Lloyd Douglas style? <laughs> oh, gee. I'm not really sure. I guess I'd have to point them in the directions that I kind of start in. I know there's some licks that I do that I, you know, that might be a little different. I mean, I could show them some of them. Uh, as far as yeah, what's an example of that? Like maybe well, maybe there's one lick that I had that when I was playing with Jim and Jesse, the bass player called it the airplane lick, and I don't know why he called it that. <laughs> But it's just like... Ah. So I go... 
don't know why he called it that, but he says it's like an airplane winding up taking off. <laughs> My hand's a little tight today for some reason, but uh, yeah, that was that it's was one. humid. You, yeah, you got some of the. Yeah, I had to stretch out my finger picks to put them on. But yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, as far as signature licks, uh, I know there's a few, but I mean, I just can't really. How do you? You are pretty great at the the single string Reno stuff. In fact, I heard what was the track that I heard off of the the Scott Brannon album. Oh yeah, your tears are just an interest on the loan. That that sounds like it, it could be. Don Reno playing it, except for oh. the modern recording technology. Oh, it. thank you. Yeah. I, I uh. forgot about that recording. Um, yeah, I don't remember what I did on that now. It's been a while. Yeah, it's 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 almost a a, a dead on Reno stuff. <clears throat> Do you remember some things that helped you get up to speed on that? Because I find a lot, definitely for myself, but what a lot of people say is it's just so hard to play it fast. Um, it is. So, uh, do you remember how you practiced that? Were you running scales? Were you just learning tunes? Uh, I think Scott sent me some of the stuff, and I just would practice with it till I could get it. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I don't. I just figure out what I want to do for a break, and then I just. I just play it. I mean, I have to work on it, of course, to get it at the speed, but I don't really practice scales too much, um, really at all. I mean, I just kind of practice just playing. So it sounds like what you what you just said was you had a, you were hearing something in your mind that you thought would maybe be a cool thing to do or an appropriate thing to do. Yep. Uh, and you're almost learning it from your, your inner ear, wh- yep. whatever you want to call it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Is is that a pretty common approach even today when you when you hear a song just you imagine what would be the coolest thing for a banjo player to do and <laughs> and try to learn that from yourself? Well, yeah, I don't know if it's the coolest thing, but <laughs> yeah, I just kind of hear what I hear in my head and then that's I just try to apply it to the song and that's that's how I just work it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move on to talking about your gear here. What okay. what uh what's your main banjo and take us through we have a lot of banjo nerds listening to the show so so they always like to hear about your picks and your bridge and your head and your tailpiece okay. and your setup so take give us a tour of of what you're playing well the banjo i'm playing today is the one that my parents bought me this when i was like 10 years old so I, this is the one that yeah i've had this thing for basically my whole life no kidding um i've played, been playing maybe a year or two when i got it Joel Mabus owned it before me from Lansing oh huh, yeah and i got it and i think got it in 1982 and it's a 1972 uh at least I elderly said it was 1972 Gibson RB250, and it's all stock, um, except for the head, which is a five-star head, and I got a Snuffy Smith bridge on it. Um, but other than that, except for the Scruggs tuners, on, or the cam tuners, on, or the Scruggs tuners, it's all original. The rim is delaminated. It's pulling up back here. <laughs> the neck's been broke twice. <laughs> Tailpiece is snapped in the back. Oh, no. But it's been this way for probably 20 years. It has some scars. Yeah, but it's, it's still sounding great. It's a it's a great banjo. It's still my my I use it on all my recording sessions almost all the time I play. Huh. And then uh, I I always use pretty much '70s Nationals because that's what I had when I was growing up playing. And I I use the same basically the same set of picks for 30 years. And then uh, a friend uh, Dave Conley Jr. gave me these older Nationals. I think what they probably be called uh, Circle Eights. Okay. And I just started using them. I love them. They're really nice too. And my other banjo I play, I have a Sullivan Greenbrier. I think that's what you got. Don't you have a Greenbrier? I, I have a uh, a Bardstown. Oh, it's the Bards. mahogany one. Oh, you got the, the Greenbrier is the maple, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I have yeah. one of those, and uh, it's a great banjo. I got that in like 2004 when I decided that you know after flying and having them break my neck twice. Oh, is that how that happened? Yeah, right here. Oh yep. no. Twice. Uh, I, I thought I'd better get another banjo to fly with <laughs> because this just means a lot to me, even though it's you know it's been through a lot. But uh, I've had it so long that I don't want to lose it, and I don't want to have it broke anymore. 
Yeah. So I, I got the Sullivan, and it's a really fine instrument, too. Mm-hmm. And I use that some, too. Changing the head is something I've been working through recently. I changed it, and it didn't sound the same, so now I'm kind of fretting between what do I go to. I thought the five-star heads were discontinued. Is that right? So is this mm-hmm. likely maybe the last one you're ever going to get to use or what? I shouldn't say this, but I have one in reserve. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I had one. Somebody might be looking for me after this to buy yeah. it. But uh, <laughs> this one, I put this one on probably 10 years ago. And I don't change head very often, but the one I had on here started to get a crack underneath the tailpiece. Another, oh, like uh, splitting open, splitting, you mean? Splitting, yeah. Oh. And uh, I'd never... Once I set it up, I hardly ever touch it. Huh. So, I mean, I set it up, and then maybe like a month later, I have to adjust it again a little bit, and I, I rarely touch them. Wow. I just yeah. leave them alone. I think I'm going toward that end of things. I've yeah. been on like a change the head every three years or something, and mm-hmm. I don't know. Last time I did it, it kind of messed with the tone, so I better just <laughs> I better just leave it from now on. Yeah, I do the same thing. When I was younger, I'd mess with it, and it would never be the same. It seemed like it took forever to get back, so I, I just learned just uh-huh. leave it. Don't only do it if you have to. And there is something about the five star heads that you prefer. Yeah, I guess I, it sort of had it on it when I got it, so I never okay. really messed around with anything else. So I guess that's why I just kept going back to them. I, I like it the way it is. So cool, and it's a stock bridge too. That's a. A Snuffy Smith bridge. Oh, got so, it, got it. I, I don't know where I got it, but somebody gave me one, and the one I had on it was warping, so I, I took it off and put this on there. Very good. Yeah. Let's go to other other gear that you use. Do you have preferences for either performing or recording in terms of microphones or any other gear that you think is important to what you do? Uh, as far as uh, microphones and stuff, uh, whatever they usually have, I just use. I don't have a preference. Both in the studio and... Uh, Stage. Well, right now, well, playing with a uh, full chord, um, Todd has an SM81 that I like. That's been really nice, mm-hmm. and that seems to work out pretty good. Yeah, but it's not some something that you can't live without, or no, <laughs> okay. no, I haven't found anything. I'm not a gearhead. Yeah, I, I kind of got that from the fact that your banjo is still the same way <laughs> that it was in Actually, 1983 or whatever. You it said. needs a fret job. I mean, I. The last time I got a fret job on it was probably 15 years ago, and okay. I, I'm really regretting even doing it when I first got it done. It was like, oh, man. And then now it's, it really needs one, and it's like, I'm going to have to get on that. Starting to bottom out a little yeah, bit. Yeah, starting to work into the fretboard here. It's, you know, yeah, and the intonation's getting off in the little places, uh-huh. so it's, it needs to be done. <laughs> I'm going to move to online social media questions. Sometimes I give people a heads up on who I'm interviewing and and I solicit questions. So I have one or two for you from Facebook listeners. Okay. This is uh, Kate from Michigan. Okay. (laughs) Are you, are you, are you getting what's happening here? (laughs) Yeah, I got it. What's your favorite hat? And I guess my, the interviewer's sidebar, how many hats are we, do we have here? Why is this a question? I'm not really sure, but um, usually I only wear a Detroit tiger cap. So that's probably, but I have a lot of caps, but. Detroit okay. Tigers hat is my favorite one. I usually wear that all the time. So it's home, probably the, huh? home cap, away cap, home cap. Okay, yeah, yeah, got home. it. White D, white D. And we're talking the classic old English D, classic not old. any of this like weird fangled. Right, none of the you know, weird they fangled. Put all the, yeah, yeah, they're they're a normal home hat. Got it, yeah. got it. Very good. Yeah, fitted or tri- yeah, I got a fitted one. Yeah. Oh, size seven. Kind You're of serious. So if anybody is out there, you know, <laughs> has a size seven, they can get rid of them. Especially if it's a cool tiger hat. Yeah. Next, uh, M. Bub from Tennessee. Someone who apparently knows a lot about bluegrass. Yeah, I've heard of him. <laughs> Where can we get the Ray Davis basement tapes you played on? And how, how about you go ahead and fill us in on what, what he's even talking about there, the Ray Davis okay. basement tapes. Well, when I was playing with uh, David Davis and the Warrior River Boys, they would do a lot of work up there around uh, Washington for Ray Davis, who was a very famous uh, bluegrass DJ that worked at D- WAMU. Mm-hmm. And before that, he used to do a lot of recordings in his basement of the Stanley Brothers and Reno and Harold and Reno and Smiley. And uh, when they would pass through and he put them out on the Wango label, I'm not even sure if that's how it's said. but um, Yeah, so- David. W-A-N-G-O is, yep. yeah, I think you're probably right. Yeah, I think it's Wango. And uh, so he had all these classic recordings. He did Charlie Moore. I mean, there was a bunch that he did. And we go up there and uh, he would record stuff for David. Mm-hmm. And David's band would play on some of this stuff. Well, when I went up there, they were doing some stuff with Scott Brandon singing 
lead vocals on it and David, and then I, for some reason they wanted some lead guitar on the, most of this stuff. So I'd, I'd play like Reno style guitar mm -hmm. and like maybe some cross picking guitar. That, um, I wouldn't say it's really Scheffler style because I do it more of like a Jesse McReynolds role on it. But, okay. But so I'd play a lot of guitar on this stuff and some banjo too. And uh, we recorded a lot of stuff there for Ray. And then he would play it on WAMU. And he'd come up with these CDs for fundraisers that he'd do for the WAMU because it was a public radio station. And a lot of times, <laughs> Mike says where to get them. I'd like to get some of them myself because um, a lot of times I, I never really, sometimes I didn't get a lot of them. I mean, I had to ask Ray and then he'd give me one. Right. And uh, I know David Davis might be able to get some. I mean, if Mike was okay. looking for him. Um, I have some. And Ray has passed away. He's been gone for a little while, right? Yeah, I'd say I think he passed away in uh, 2014. Okay. 2013, somewhere in there. Yeah. So there's no going, no going right to the source. No, no, yeah. not going to Ray. But I mean, David used to, I think, have some of those. But yeah, there a lot, a lot of people know about him, and I'm sure, I know, I think Mike has mentioned it to me before when I've seen him once about him, but. Yeah, he's he's a very. Um, I, I was just at his place doing an interview too, and he's very much a an archivist. He has his LP collection is, mm -hmm. is something to behold. Oh, that'd be cool. To and see. yeah, he he just loves all that stuff, which is cool. Is there anything else that I forgot to to ask that maybe advice for other pickers or? Uh, well, as far as advice, I mean, I'm not sure what worked for everybody, but I know when I was growing up plan to play i just listened to the groups that i really liked and i tried to play with you know try to learn all the much of their material as i could i take a cassette player around to record all these things and then i come home and learn their sets but i know one thing that i have seen out there and this is a little advice and is if you're going to try out for a band learn their material before you go because <laughs> i mean i've been in some bands where people show up and they don't know any of the material and i mean that just is something I can't comprehend, but right. it's just some advice for people that, you know, if you're going to try out for a band, if there's bands you like, just learn the material and be ready because you never know if they're looking for somebody, you might be able to, you know, pop in there. Yeah. And uh, another thing is learn to sing, which is, is very important. Lynn Morris told me that sometimes it's not the better picker that gets a job. Sometimes it's a better singer. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really a good singer, so, but I can do parts if I have to, if I'm forced. And, uh, but that's a good thing to do is learn how to sing parts. That's all the advice I can think of off the top of my head. That's all good stuff. Where do people find you and your music online, websites, anything like that? I uh, usually Goodwills or no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a full chord, we have our new album out and they could probably get that off of, uh, our Facebook page. Some of the stuff I played on before, I'm not even sure where to get that. I mean, some of the Jim and Jesse stuff might be still be able to avail get that on County sales. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott Brandon album I think you can get that from County Sales I know they had it Virginia I, I will say I got to sub in for you once or twice uh, during your detour days oh yeah, yeah. and so uh, those became some of my favorite or is it just one record that you're on yeah uh, I just did the one Going Nowhere Fast Going Nowhere Fast mm -hmm. that became one of my favorite banjo albums and I thought well, I was just you. studying for the gig and I was like oh this you know well thank it you became uh, really cool to listen to well thanks and thanks for setting in for me that was i heard you guys did pretty good without me i, I hope scared. so i i had i was doing the thing that happens to you with michael cleveland where i fe <laughs> felt like i was hanging by the seat of my pants you know just trying not to play something really terrible oh the, from what i heard you did fine okay good so, I'm, I'm glad you heard that after I, after what i heard i thought i better not miss any more gigs and might not have a job well hey thanks again and uh you know, look forward to seeing the set today. And, well, thanks. Thanks and, for having me. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. You heard some sound clips in this episode in order. They were Downtown by Full Chord, Limehouse Blues by Reno and Smiley, 321 and Then I Can See Clearly Now by Detour. Silvertone Blues by Full Chord, Blowing Up a Storm by Jesse McReynolds, and Your Tears Are Just Interest on the Loan, performed by Scott Brannon. Thank you once again to Otis Supply Company for hosting me during this interview. And of course, a special thanks to today's Patreon supporter of the show, Renee Redmond. Go to patreon.com slash banjo podcast 
to become a supporter yourself, get a hold of me at pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com. And I'm going to quit here while I am still safe from this horrible, gigantic spider. So I, I apparently will live to make another podcast. So keep tuning in and I'll see you next time. Bye.